Hello, and welcome to another video by Liminal Spaces. Today I am very excited because I get to talk about one of my favorite fantasy novels, which is Mary Stewart's The Crystal Cave. This is a uh, the first book in a trilogy, although I think it later had two more books added. Uh, but it was called a trilogy the whole time I was growing up. Uh, this is her first book in the trilogy of her Merlin series. Uh, and it is a book that looks at the Arthurian myths from the perspective of uh, Merlin. Before I get into the book proper, uh, I wanted to give just kind of a quick history about it. For me personally, I read this when I was a teenager. It was actually recommended by my mom. Uh, I don't know where she discovered it, but she absolutely loved it and passed it on to me. I was, as I've said before, a voracious reader of the horror genre, so this was a little bit of a detour for me, but I absolutely loved it. Uh, and it really started for me a love of fantasy that, that I've taken into my adult life, and now I read fantasy just as often as I do horror and science fiction. Um, so that's kind of my history with the book. The actual history of the book is very interesting. Mary Stewart was born in 1916. Unfortunately, she died recently in 2014, but she lived to be 97 years old. Um, she was known throughout the 50s and 60s as mainly a romantic thriller writer. Uh, here's a copy of her book, The Gabriel Hounds. This is the first edition. Um, and yeah, it's got these kind of creepy mansions on the cover and it's part of the same, um, genre that Victoria, Victoria Holt and uh, others were writing in. Uh, I always ca ca call them Gothic romances. Um, and I feel like they have through the Victorian Gothics, a connection to the horror genre, uh, but that's a completely different video. Anyway, that's kind of what she was known through for the 50s and 60s, uh, and she was considered one of the best of that genre. Uh, she was, she is still a beloved writer in that genre. Um, so uh, she was kind of busy doing her thing in that genre. Uh, but in the late 1960s, due mainly to the hippie counterculture, uh, there was kind of a revival uh, of interest in fantasy books, specifically T.H. White's The Once and Future King. Uh, the first part of this book uh, was called The Sword and the Stone, uh, and it, of course, was event eventually... Uh, uh, made into a Disney movie with the same title, The Sword and the Stone. Uh, this was published in 1958. So this became popular again because of the hippie counterculture, and so did this one, The Book of Merlin, also T.H. White. Uh, I just bring this one up because it's also about Merlin. But along with uh, T.H. White's... Um, the Once and Future King, uh, The Lord of the Rings regained popularity. It was released in its entirety for the first time in 1956. Portions of it had been published before, um, but yeah, it, uh, it really gained popularity in the late 60s. So during this kind of revival of interest, uh, Mary Stewart was reading Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain. This makes sense because she was a lecturer uh, of Anglo-Saxon literature at the Durham School uh, during this, uh, or early in her life, before she became a writer. She was a lecturer uh, for quite a few years. So it makes sense that she would be connected to this type of literature, this era of literature. Um, so she was reading this, and this is kind of the first literary telling of King Arthur's myths. Um, before that, they were, they were mentions, but the story as we know it today uh, started to solidify in this book. Uh, so she was reading this, and she came up with the idea of 
telling the story of the Arthurian myths from the perspective of Merlin. And that's when the idea was born. Uh, Mary Stewart was interesting because she never had an agent. She Her first book she sent to the publishers Hodder and Stoughton. Forgive me if I've uh, mispronounced that. Um, and she stuck with those publishers her entire writing career. Um, so she never needed an agent or anything like that. Uh, needless to say, her publishers were terrified because this was an, a huge change in genre for Mary Stewart. She was basically jumping for what she was well known for and beloved for, which was the thriller suspense. I mean, the uh, um, romantic thrillers, gothic suspense, uh, and jumping to the fantasy genre, which was kind of a budding genre at the time. There's been many fantasy writers uh, before, but they weren't called fantasy writers until much later. Um, so she was making a genre jump, uh, not only from a genre that she was beloved for, but to a genre that really was just budding and... They didn't know what kind of audience it would have. Um, so they were they were understandably terrified, but they still put, put it out. They published the book in 1970. This is a first edition copy of The Crystal Cave um, from the UK. Uh, it's in pretty good condition. I need to get some uh, mylar on the cover there. Um, not the the best cover um i find it i mean they do they got some crystal cave going on it looks like they took a close-up of a geode uh, and put that that picture in there um but yeah i feel like it doesn't really capture the essence and that may be because the publishers themselves didn't really know what a fantasy novels cover would look like um, so they just kind of went with what they could. The American pub pub publication is even less imaginative. Um, I actually prefer the British cover way more than this one. Just putting the, uh, the text on the cover is always kind of a, uh, a cheap way to go, in my opinion. Uh, Interview with the Vampires, first edition, did the same thing. Another one of my least favorites. Um, but they published this in 1970, even though they were afraid uh, of what kind of, or what it would do to their publishing house and to Mary Stewart's career. Uh, but luckily, um, the book rose quickly to number one and was, uh, was number one for weeks on the charts. Um, and now... Uh, it is actually probably what Mary Stewart is best known for. I know that the Merlin books sell more than any of other uh, any of Mary Stewart's other books, uh, and the small amount of people I see talking about her talk often about the, more often about the Merlin books than uh, any of her other books, which is too bad. Uh, although these books are, in my opinion, her best, the other ones are incredible as well. The her 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 incredible writing, uh, you can see throughout all of the books, uh, all of her books. And now the book. The book itself is incredible because she basically takes the Arthurian myth, uh, which has very um, structured and retold plot points, and makes the first four. So she follows Merlin's life from the age of six to the conception of Arthur, uh, of Arthur. The four plot points or mythic points that she hits, and this is a bit of a spoiler uh, warning, but of course this myth is well known throughout the world, so if you'd like to not have the book spoiled, you can skip this, this portion, but uh, I am going to list out the, the four parts of the myth that she covers. Uh, the first she covers is that Merlin is born to either no father or, to the fa uh, or that his father is a devil or a demon. The second part of the myth is that, that uh, Merlin um, 
explains through a vision to King Vortigan why the walls of his fortress keep falling down. Um, he reveals a lake underneath the for or the the fortress, and while he's down there, he prophesizes the coming of King Arthur. Um, he rebuilds Stonehenge, uh, moving a stone from Ireland. Um, and he also, of course, and this is probably the the point of the myth most well known. Uh, he changes Uther, King Uther's appearance, so that uh, uh, to the to that of the Duke of Cornwall, so that he can sleep with Ygraine, which is the conception of Arthur, and that's where the book ends. Um, but the incredible part about this book, the part that I feel. Um, makes it the best retelling of the Arthurian legends uh, in the fantasy in the fantasy genre are the spaces in between the massive points of the myth. Um, first off, her characters are incredible, and this is true throughout all of her writing. Uh, but she, to me, shares kind of that power with Stephen King to really create a character that you feel like you know, like they're, they're a friend that you've known for years uh, just by reading the novel. And all of her characters jump off the page this way. Just absolutely incredible. Her prose is absolutely beautiful without being difficult to read. It's very smooth. These books um, are not difficult to read, but they are still poetic. Uh, her setting is strong. She creates beautiful images. Uh, the Crystal Cave itself is absolutely incredible, uh, the way it's described. The way she deals with magic, with the, the fantasy of this book, is beautifully done, uh, because for her, it is a balance. The magic in this is real. This is fantasy. Uh, but it's also incredibly rare. Um, and Merlin can't control when the power comes to him. So a lot of these uh, plot points are explained through just his natural intelligence and education. Uh, and then the moments that are the real magic uh, are are stunningly described and really of course take it out of Merlin um, also the way that Merlin understands the people that he is surrounded by and uses reputation to create and drive his own mythos is really well done in these books um, it is just absolutely incredible. Uh, for me, rating-wise, this is a 10 out of 10 all day. Uh, it is probably my favorite fantasy novel. Uh, it goes above The Lord of the Rings, which I know is going to uh, um, probably make a lot of people uh, disagree with me, uh, at the least. Um, but... I highly recommend this. If you pick this up and start reading it or get it on Audible, the reading on Audible is absolutely incredible, um, you will not be disappointed. I guarantee a couple chapters in, you will be hooked and you will read all three of the trilogy and the books that follow. Um, so yeah, I highly, highly recommend this. Um, the BBC made a miniseries uh, of these books in the 1990s. It was called Merlin of the Crystal Cave. Uh, and it is infamous for how bad it is, which is too bad because every time I read these books, and I read them quite often, every time I read these books, I am shocked that there isn't an incredible TV series made out of these. This should be a Netflix series all day. It would be incredible. It's, it's all in the books already um, and would be just perfectly a perfect fantasy series to 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 bring to visual life uh, in that format I would love to see it 
Um, and just one more kind of little uh, little note. Um, the year after she wrote this novel, she was probably already working on the second at this point, but she wrote a kid's book. Uh, this came out in 1971. It's called The uh, Little Broomstick. Uh, and this one was adapted to film, and it's the first time that I, I know of that Mary Stewart has been adapted really well to film. I do know that some of her uh, um, thriller romance novels have been adapted, and I haven't seen those, so I'm not sure how well they did. Uh, but this is a children's book in the fantasy genre, and it was adapted in 2017, I believe, uh, into an animated film called Mary and the Witch's Flower. And if you haven't seen that film, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful film and very well done. Anyway, that's a little bit about Mary Stewart. I will be talking about her more in the future, especially as I go through the other books in the uh, Merlin trilogy uh, and probably when I make some videos on the gothic romances uh, I'll talk about her more there as well. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video please give it a like and if you like this kind of content please subscribe. Thank you very much and we'll see you again.